today's event is given in memory of Simon Heald, a um, Dr. Simon Heald, um, a, a most interesting thinker who is sadly missed um, in the town, a great friend of the festival, and indeed a great fan of the work of Will Self, um, who we're going to be hearing from. So we're very pleased to have been able to connect those two events together. Um, okay, so our speaker today is Professor of Modern Thought at Brunel University with a specialism in psychogeography. Um, but Will Self is first and foremost a writer, a writer of 11 novels, five collections of short stories, three novellas, nine collections of nonfiction writing, of which the most recent is the central topic of today's um, event, which is why read a collection of Will's nonfiction articles and other writings. But he's a polymath in the true sense of the word. Um, he's also a broadcaster, a political commentator, a philosopher, or perhaps you know him from his appearances on Have I Got News For You, or alongside Vic and Bob on Shooting Stars, or indeed on Question Time. He is on top of this a walker and a thinker and describes himself as a modern flaneur. Winner of the Jeffrey Faber Memorial Prize, the Bollinger Everyman Prize, long-listed and short-listed for the Booker Prize, we are delighted to welcome the, well, I'll let him tell you whether he thinks this definition still applies, the enfant terrible that is Will Self to Berwick's 10th Literary Festival. A big warm welcome to you from Berwick, Will. Yeah, thank you for that, Nolan. No, I, I don't think it probably still applies uh, en fond terrible. I think it reflects, of course, it's French. Uh, it means So it reflects a culture that was, while we mock it in England, was still Francophile to the extent of using French tags in a kind of complimentary way. So, uh, you know, it's it's a it, it has it has that kind of uh, aura around it of all French tags of kind of an association with with perhaps cultures that are more self conscious literary cultures than than our own, uh, and I think it reflects a kind of state of affairs that used to obtain in the world of literature in this country, which was that. Um, there was a kind of there were only very limited number of roles available it was a sort of a, a set of rather like the commedia dell'arte there were only a kind of like columbine or, though actually there were many more roles in the commedia dell'arte than there were in the literary world of london say up until the turn of the millennium uh and one of them was you know you might be a, a grand old man and i say man advisedly there were some women who were perhaps accorded a similar status, but, you know, literature was predominantly uh, ruled over by men and arguably was one of the kind of main patriarchal institutions until very, very recently. Uh, and, and you could be an enfant terrible. And demographically, there wasn't a lot in between it. Either you were evincing evidence of a kind of rebelliousness and a kind of... Uh, Oedipal anger, or you'd attained a kind of comfortable uh, situation. You'd signed your name after Byron's in the Book of Signatures at the Royal Society of Literature. You'd received a, a D-lit of some kind. Your books were in the right editions. They were perhaps taught, and this is quite important on school curriculums. Uh, but it wasn't a lot in between. It was just being a jobbing writer. Uh, and, and so you could remain an enfant terrible for a very long time indeed, obviously past the point where you could be even remotely biologically considered to be a child in, <laughs> in any way. You would still in literary terms, because, of course, in literature, there's only really two main statuses of importance. One is what people read and buy by implication today. And what is and the other is what people will read and quite possibly, but increasingly unlikely, buy in the future. Yeah. Uh, and, and to be a grand old man, or nowadays a grand old woman, you would have to have that sense of assured security of having attained canonical status. 
So you would have to be a writer of whom it could be confidently asserted that there was a strong likelihood that their works would be read, not necessarily by virtue of their virtues, maybe for institutional reasons uh, in, in the future, and quite possibly the distant future, in which case they would achieve what used to be thought of as classic status. So this interplay between the canonical, uh, the long-term, the transcendent, uh, and present popularity is what summons into existence the dichotomy between the enfant terrible and the grand old man. And 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 once it's gone, of course, that no longer obtains. And and I I think it is gone. I mean, you're perhaps more au fait. In fact, I'm almost certain you are with contemporary literature than I am. And I'm only sixty two. Who's the enfant terrible de nos jours? Well, I think we could um, still look at some of your um, earlier fiction, indeed, and it, and, it, and it maintains its, you know, its its enfant terrible status in that it's still disturbing. I think some of the things that it was disturbing when it was perhaps first published, and and, uh, and we'll come on perhaps to, to your most recent, your, you know, your trilogy beginning with Umbrella, perhaps later in the. Um, in the interview, if we um, looking at the at the collection, where well, obviously the the, the uh, titular essay is indeed why read. Um, it, am I right? Would it be right to describe that as a kind of lament for um, a way of reading that that you see as being kind of profoundly disrupted, if not indeed um, distorted beyond recognition by by the kind of methods the the the, the um, the arrival of digital um, text and that kind of two-way interactive version of text? Well, I mean, I think nobody wants to be the, the old man or woman bitterly shaking their fist at the cloud. It's not a good look. And, and in our culture, which is a culture of modernity, the idea of being a Luddite or being anti-technology is, of course, you know, kind of slightly anathema. And we're all placed in a difficult, you know, sort of, invidious position if we we adopt that i for example am kept alive and have been for over a decade by drugs that simply wouldn't have existed uh even 50 years ago so the very my very life all the books i've written in the past decade depend upon technologies that have been created within my own lifetime so you know very very hard to kind of make a case against technology in any broad sense but at the same time we're highly aware in contemporary culture that we face a crisis in a sense of our own making i mean i, ha I happen to believe it isn't in in the sense that we could not have done other than we have done clever monkeys that we are uh but you know the environmental crisis is anthropogenic in the sense of being human caused and there seems precious little we can do about it uh, and, and it's technologically massively accelerated by the industrial and now technological revolutions. And indeed, the principal contributor to global heating at the moment is the increasing capacity of the Internet and the web it supports. So we're, you know, even this very Zoom meeting is, is by no yeah. means uh, uh, sustainable activity. Um, so, you know, I think there's this paradox really kind of impacts and, and inflects on, on the way we, we see all of this and the way we see what reading is as well, because reading is supported by different kinds of, of kind of media technology. And, and you know, um, Marshall McLuhan writing in the 60s and understanding media which is perhaps the bible of doing just that understanding the revolutions in media technology and the transition from print to digital that's that's, that's happened in our own uh, uh lifetimes uh yeah. most of us watching uh you know was already talking in terms of and he's writing in the 60s before the web late 50s understanding media before the web's come into being he's anticipating uh what he calls the global village uh, facilitated by technology, but he's already talking in terms of the Gutenberg mind, yes. mind that is formed by movable type, the mind that was formed by the print revolution of the 15th century as a, as a fundamental type of human being. Now, it's a philosophic question of how the human symbolic mind actually interacts with the human's environment. So let's just set that big one to one side. 
there's no doubt in my mind that the shift from page to screen is an epical shift in the way that the human mind is operating yeah and 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 will affect psychology will affect being in the world in quite profound ways how much that really affects the world is is an entirely different question actually we can look at it as a separate question but the literary culture supported by a human society that was itself dependent on industrialized forms that were integral to that nemo technology to that transmission of of data is gone and is going is almost completely gone in our lifetime and teachers like you nolan who teach yeah. english literature you're like hipsters with sort of hand tooled leather satchels and what you know mustache wax riding yeah. penny farthings yeah. you're you're very subject and 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 McLuhan would say your very psychology is formed by this redundant technology. You're like a book. I can read you like a book, sir. Yeah. Whereas, of course, with younger people, their minds are formed by screens. And and perhaps I can I don't need to read them in any way at all. So is that um and I do have some, not not moustache wax, but I do have a little bit of beard oil on today, so that, that ties in nicely. Is, yeah. is, that, is, that, is that shift um, predominantly from the reading as a solitary act, do you think? You know, the idea that, and, and coming back to your point about um, human-generated um, climate change and the catastrophe that you, um, I think, agree is already too far gone for us to really do anything markedly about it. Um, of course, books will be one of the things that we can, you know, still read in the in the glare of the burning cities behind us because they don't require that power. But do you think is it is it that shift from being able to read as a as a it being a predominantly solitary activity to one where now there's a there's a e even if reading a book on a Kindle, you know, you're still connected. It's still it's still a kind of um, collected experience. Is that the primary shift? Do you think? Well, I know that they're always trying to get, and you might think that it coincides brilliantly with the technology, with these sorts of things. And, and you know, it shouldn't surprise you to see I have one of these. I've got the library of many, many thousands of digital books. I find it fantastic. I mean, when it, when it came along, I remember meeting a friend who's quite a well-known literary critic and, and writer about 20 years ago in the street, and he was sort of looking at this silly little thing in his hand. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm reading Balzac. And he had, you know, he was an early adopter technologi technologically. He had an early iPhone and he had a Kindle program on it and he was reading Balzac. And and the minute I realized you could just download anything that was out of copyright, it became ridiculous trying to resist this as someone who's yeah. interested in books. I mean, obviously I have a lot of other books as well. You can see quite a lot of print yeah. books. But yeah, I mean... You know, it's. I think I, I I quote it somewhere in 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 the collection. One of the essays in the collection. You know, this this moment when uh, the, the the future Saint Augustine comes upon uh, his bishop in his garden in Rome, uh, yeah. and, and his bishop is reading silently, yeah. which which he's never seen before. Augustine, he's never seen anybody who reads without vocalizing the words as they read them, because of course reading's collective early on. A few people can do it. You need a reader, and and the paradigm certainly in the Christian world is of 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 somebody reading to monks when they're at, at, at compline when they're doing things throughout the day. So it's it's a sacerdotal thing in that way. So in a sense, silent reading has its own epoch, and it relates to certain technologies. But I think the the thing you're pointing to, Nolan, that's more significant is the containment within the text. Yeah. The point about reading uh, an old fashioned book is you're kind of stuck in it. And, and the thing was really up until say, up until you got a point when you could get something like this, you can press on it and get a definition. You came across a word when you were reading and you didn't really understand it. You, you'd have to get up, cross the room, get a dictionary down, look it up. At that point, you might as well learn the definitions of the words either side of it, unless you're a complete plank. You've bothered to get a heavy volume out of the out of the shelf. You've bothered to find the definition, and it's quite a faff, you know, thousands of onion skin pages, blah blah blah. John Middleton Murray, blah blah blah, blah blah blah. You know, Surgeon of Crowthorn, all the way through. Find your definition. 
Well, you might as well find, you might as well note down what the other words are. So you were always increasing your word power in, in that way, yeah. if you could be bothered. And the other one was you might just think, and you would think, in fact, well, I don't understand the word here, but I'll probably, I'll carry on reading and I'll probably come across it in a different context. And by calibrating the two, I'll understand it. And that's yeah. what you would do. So the act of reading and in containment, I think this is so hard for people. To, to accept at the moment because it, it outrages them because what they then realize is they're kind of screwed. I mean, the other main phenomenon which we'll get to is writing on screen, of course, yeah. which is another big problem. Uh, but you know, a, a, that you lose entirely the exercise of the reading muscle within, as it were, the, the sort of jungle gym of the text itself. The text is no longer affording you the opportunity to strengthen those kind of uh, you, the, your own internal nemo technology. A lot of this stuff was well identified in a, in a book by Nicholas Carr called The Shallows very early on and has been confirmed by empirical research. Of course, it's not the whole story. I mean, to a limited, to an extent. So, yeah, I think how we read in that sense is very important. But I also think, you know, and, and it'd be interesting if we get some q a to hear from some younger people you know yeah. i know that people regard the sort of digital native digital immigrant distinct yeah, yeah. as pretty crass uh but it does seem to me that the younger people as it were at best have a kind of different attitude towards personal boundaries uh, mm. that perhaps older people have in a way their covers are more transparent you might say in yeah. other words the old adage don't read a book by its cover is perhaps it doesn't apply to them exactly at the point at which of course the old codex itself is being superseded um <laughs> Uh, maybe you should read them by their cover in the sense that they've already have a pre-presence in the form of social media, image feeds, biographical information, et cetera, et cetera, that you never would have had in the past. You know, yes. I've, you know I've done a deep dive on you, Nolan. I know huge amounts about yeah. before we started this session. I've looked at photos of you at university i've looked up things on you know all sorts of stuff about you i feel i know you intimately so you know i don't well, that, that, judge you i wouldn't well, judge you by your cover no 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 that's a slight, on that slightly alarming note I, I know you've um i know you've written i think you, i think you mentioned it in the book but i think also in some of your other writing about the not being convinced that the um the, the internet and that kind of digital connectivity is really as democratic as it's perhaps lauded as being. Um, and I was just thinking as you're talking there, one would think that the ability to um, be connected to those sources to make under, to understand the text um, more directly would have made more difficult texts open to a wider audience in that, that you know, you know, there's that there's almost that helpful guide along with you. But actually, I get the sense from when you look at, you know, what we should read and how we should read that actually that's not happening. And, and really that um, people are reading much less demanding texts. They're not reading um, texts that are that, that are um, that are complex. And I think the description you give of it is you, you, you imagine that reading of the serious literary novel is going to become something like going to see chamber music. Yeah, or or a sort of more, I think, a conservatoire. Yeah, a conservatoire yeah, yeah. form, more like easel painting in the sense that yeah, the yeah. money is to be made with conceptual work. So you know, the money is to be made with, as it were, the the conceptual equivalent of narrative work, whatever that might be. Um, uh, and and it's mostly pursued with any. But I mean, of course, in a sense, this was always true by people who have the means to do it. It's 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 just still as closed off, really, to people from from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds economically as it always was. Nothing has changed on that front. And you know what infuriates me most, and is you know along with all of the other factors involved in the new technology, has has happily marginalised me in this culture. Is, is calling out the publishing industry itself on this. Because, of course, very few people talk about it. You, you know, you would have... You, the band plays on, you know. It's, it's the main 
a, a message here. But yeah, I think it's 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 kind of you know last year 19, uh, 1922 was the great you know Annus terrificus of, of high modernism publication of Eliot's the wasteland publication of, of yes. uh, first first publication by Shakespeare and Company of Joyce's Ulysses uh you know Virginia Woolf famously wrote you know in an in and around 1912 something happened so 10 years before you've had this great modernist shock that Woolf identifies all of her amazing novels being written at this period, Catherine Mansfield stuff being written, Juna Barnes, yeah. uh, Hope Murley's extraordinary wave. I mentioned the women because, again, modernism is often identified with male artists. It shouldn't be. A um, uh, lot of hoo ha book, book talkers are going to be here. Uh, we're going to be collectively reading you. Just, none of it happened. Yeah, yeah. It happened. I don't. I didn't never met, and I'm in the bit. I know. I mean, admittedly, I'm not that social, but I didn't meet anybody who told me they've actually read Ulysses for the first time last year. Or, you know, the real climacteric for me, and and you know, people may find this annoying, but it's when somewhere along the way, Bloomsbury, um, J.K. Rowling's publisher, published two editions of of the next Harry Potter, and they put one. In a in a grown up cover and yeah. one in a kids cover, uh, yeah. and they did it so that so that older people could read the book as it were without feeling ashamed of their reading tastes. They should have felt ashamed. Yeah, they should be ashamed. When I went to teach at the university, uh, I helped set up a course called Reading Resilience, which was designed to help people coming from A level school level of reading literature who were no longer capable of reading a book cover to cover. They couldn't do it, and yet they would, they'd been admitted to an English research university to read English literature. Okay, yes, yes. So right. I, I think so I, I could go on in this vein quite a lot, but you know what? There are a lot of people who are. If there's anybody on this session who are, who are watching this, uh, if there's 38 participants, you'll either have children or you'll be younger and have gone through university yes. recently, and you know damn well it's the case. You know, the academic requirement on a lot of the literature courses at the place I teach at is like one essay in a presentation for a 14 week course with 150 hours of independent study. Well, but it's, it's, it's just <laughs> shameful that, and during the pandemic, the whole country voted itself a, not a pay rise, but an intellect rise. They said, well, our response to this problem is that we're going to say that we're smarter than we are. All our children are smarter than they are. QED, yeah. all of us are smarter than we are. Because we figured out how to make our children smarter than they are by massaging the figures on their results or, or not bothering to get to test them effectively in any way. Yeah. And you know what? The kids notice. Yes. Yes, I mean, I think one of the ways you you talk about um, people's reading habits and 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 you use the phrase by saying that uh, there's no there should be no guilty pleasure with reading as long as you're aware that you are what you eat. Mm. And I suppose that, that's you know that that that's the great loss. I suppose if we're losing that sophistication and demand of reading, because rather than um, that technological revolution opening that up, instead it's funneling down into a Primarily paradox. A paradox. You, people became literary omnivores because they didn't have access yeah, to all that yeah. stuff. So you'd be stuck. You'd be. You'd have been a night out on the Raz in yes. Arik, and and the beak would have banged you up for the night. Plod would have put you in the cells, yes. and would have chucked you a sort of Dennis Wheatley paperback. You know, the Devil Rides Out. You'd read that overnight. You had nothing else to read. You'd yeah. find yourself in a doctor's surgery. You'd read a Reader's Digest condensed novel. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, yes. Um, that's all fascinating. I know we've got questions coming in as well, and I'll, we'll we'll come on to those in in time. Um, would this be a, a good opportunity for for a reading? Will do you think? Would you like to read a little from the book? I wondered. Anything occur something... to you? I don't know. I can't maybe really. The rise of the machines, maybe, or sorry, um, something perhaps from the rise of the machine. 
the rise of the machines. Okay. Uh, you're the you're you're the man. Um, well, I mean, it, you know, it's a review <laughs> piece. Um, I think I think it's a review piece looking at the uh, um, uh, at the kind of impact of. Uh, well, the rise of the machines, as he said it, and I and I think it's quite a technical piece. Yeah. But I mean, it is wise to to let ourselves remember the background to these technologies that we have ushered into our homes. Yes. Quite quite so. Uh, you know, it's like vampires let the right one in. You know, have we yeah. let the right one in? Is this right? Are we? Are we? Uh, so The Rise of Machines, written by Norbert Wiener, uh, MIT mathematician and published in 1948, Cybernetics or Control and Communications in the Animal and the Machine, is the book which first brought the term cybernetics to public attention. Synthesized from the ancient Greek, meaning to steer, navigate or govern, the coinage has resonated down the decades ever since, in the process giving rise to all sorts of odd cyber prefix neologisms. My personal favorite being the chain of American style confectioners dubbed Cyber Candy. Wiener, a famously eccentric character, had been driven to develop an overarching theory of the machine by two vital problems that had arisen during the recent war. The first was the need for an automated system that would allow British anti-aircraft gunners to hit German bombers and by extension make it possible for any gunner to hit a fast and erratically moving target. And the second was the dropping of Little Boy on Hiroshima by the 509th Composite Group of the United States Army Air Forces. Wiener, like many scientists of his generation, responded to the split-second incineration of 125,000 Japanese civilians with horror. He had an epiphany in which he saw a future of deadly conflict, dominated and perhaps even initiated by sophisticated machines. But again, in common with so many scientists of the era, Wiener had already tried to bring about just such a future by creating a machine that would massively enhance humans' ability to locate, aim, and unerringly deliver ordinance. So there's a, a little bit of the flavor of the kind of early history. I mean, it's interesting, of course, just reading that back is how literary it immediately becomes. So it makes, you know, discerning uh, listeners or viewers might think immediately of Thomas Pynchon's great novel, Gravity's Rainbow, set in during the Second World War and vitally preoccupied by the system that was developed in order to enable British anti-aircraft guns to shoot down V2 German V2 rockets, or you might think of Randall Jarrett's amazing poem, The Death of the Bell Turret Gun, uh, which is a, a, an actual pay on to, a, to a, an early piece of technology. Uh, some, some of you may be familiar with the so called Sperry Ball Turret, which is the sort of globe of glass at the back of the B 52 bomber that the rear gunner sits in that can be rotated inside a gyroscopic housing so that the guns are always aimed towards the incoming Japanese fighters. Uh, and that was, of course, one of the first automated loop systems to, in, in fact, be governed by a computer, a, a primitive computer. So all of our AI an anxieties and sort of cyborg anxieties and replicant anxieties. And the, the last line of Jarrett's poem is, uh, it's, it's about the death of the gunner. So it's the death, if you like, of the wetware in this hardware. And yeah, they yeah. say the last line of the poem is they hosed him out of the cockpit. Well, well, I mean, that leads us. Um... It's, it's just marvelous. You know, so he's writing in maybe in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, so, you know, all of this stuff spools out the other poem that, that I think is name checked in the piece is Richard Brautigan's magnificent poem that uh, 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 I often dream of a, of a cybernetic forest you know I think it's um what's the title of it um not do androids dream of electric sheep that's Philip Dick it's the other one um 
Here's the Randall Jarrell, five spare lines, black flack in the nightmare fighters. When I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. Uh, though I can't find the Broadkin poem here. Anyway, on we go. Yeah, I'm just uh, thank you very much for that. It was great to hear. Um, the I know a topic that you've you've um, that you've returned to in some of your writing, and indeed it comes up in several of the pieces here. I ought to say as well that the breadth of of ideas that are covered here. I mean, it's called why read, but it's not it's not by any means all just simply about reading. It, it ranges from um, you know those questions why and how we should read, but also to um, you know, you look at you. You, you touch on Kas, um, Kafka. You also look at um, the last um, typewriter engineer and um, your relationship with the typewriter, which perhaps we'll come on to as well. But it, it, the, the um, there are multiple references to time, and I know you've written about that um, in your um, piece, Posthumous Shock, which is not in the collection, but nonetheless has a relationship with some of the pieces in there, and. Uh, is it is it right to summarize that as saying that you 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 understand um the the very um nature of modernity as being in itself intrinsically related to the concept of trauma is that right that the, 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 yeah, the, well i think no i think modernity is traumatic yeah i mean it's as simple as that i think the reason people bleat on about how everything's traumatizing is that everything is yeah, and, yeah. and 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 the problem of it cheapening, as it were, profound trauma, yeah. like what we think of as classic PTSDs, with going back to shell shock. Yes. One of the problems I think people find it hard to accept is is that trauma may be an intrinsic, a phenomenon intrinsic to modernity, and particularly intrinsic to technology. I mean, the first widespread recognition of trauma. You know, now, of course, in common with lots of aspects of psychopathology, people go looking for a kind of archaeology of it, a prehistory of it, and they identify it everywhere. And in my essay, A Posthumous Shock, which I wrote for Harper's Magazine in New York a year or so ago, you know, what I say is that these are dubious cases, actually. I mean, uh, the thing is, some of the things, I mean, interestingly, a lot of the modern trauma movement comes out of Vietnam, and, and it's... Frankly, it's focused on perpetrators, not victims. It's not something you hear a lot from Vietnamese people. It's something you hear a lot from Americans. Uh, and, and it's actually the people who committed atrocities who seem to be very traumatized by it. But I also think the background field of mater modernity is traumatic. You know, there's this very early on people, uh, you know, people realized, for example, trains were very frightening. They were steely wheels, had lots of accidents, 1840s and 50s when the train network was going. It was a scary business. Within 10 years, the whole network of WH Smith's news agents has shimmered into being on station platforms the length and breadth of the country. People are sitting inches above the whirring steely wheels, yeah. sort of reading newspapers that they've bought in the new year and bored and sort of staring sightlessly out the window. They've been removed by the train from their sensual immersion in landscape. You know, people recognize this at the time it was happening. This smooth motion across the landscape created a panoramic effect that was wholly new, never been experienced before. Travel was immersive. It was haptic. It was profoundly sensual and perceptual. You couldn't go anywhere. You were in a landscape. It wasn't a picture in a frame divorced from you. So they experienced all of that, and then the train crashed. They were reading the Times, they were looking, at this, looking out the window sightlessly, divorced from landscape, bang, train crashed. Fantastic yeah, yeah. trauma. The key factor of trauma is its belatedness. Yeah. You know, it affects you afterwards. Why does it affect you afterwards? It's because at the time the crash happens, you're inattentive. So you're constantly trying to make up for the fact that you weren't aware, even of where you were. And the analogy really would be with something like the pandemic. The pandemic yeah. was like a collective experience of a rail crash. Because what it was, was that everybody suddenly realized that their ability to go out, play Candy Crush on the tube, go and netter with their friends, was dependent on a system of vaccines that were technologically mediated that had broken down. Yeah. yeah. Bang, bang, everybody fell on the ground. 
Now, in real human terms, I'm sorry, you know, I'm saving people's listening and it's I've been affected by COVID in my life. I have quite bad health issues myself. It's profoundly affected me. I don't mean to belittle this, but I quite like to belittle it a bit compared certainly to the historic problems we've had with infectious disease in societies like this. It was a piece of piss, right? Um, Yet it affected us profoundly. I venture to suggest it's because our suspension of disbelief in the technological bubble we live in, yeah. our candy crush, our times, our looking out the window is, you know, sort of like this is much more profound now than it's ever been before in society. And, you know, the contemporary mindset is to say, yeah, you know, flushable toilets and inoculation and, you know, before 1930, six women had six confinements and three deaths before adulthood, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. There are no counterfactuals in history. This is where we are now. And yeah. this is our problem now. Yeah, yeah. So we're in a world that is, by its very nature, um, that that technology is facilitating our kind of alienation, I suppose, from from the ability to understand the world we live in and to tie it into our, into our kind of narrative understanding. Well, the analogy is you, you don't need to be an evolutionary psychologist, but it helps. Why are we good narrativists? I mean, one of the things that prose is extraordinarily good at is conveying place yeah. and direction. You know, it's because we need to say to the other apes in our gang where the food is. Yeah. And, and we need to be able to do it well. And that's why we've developed this symbolic system and how good we are at deploying it. And, you know, it's extraordinary how the collapse in our ability to maintain a narrative and the information that a narrative conveys is, is exactly paralleled by the collapse in our inability to read a map. Yeah. When you read a paper map, you have to imaginatively place yourself in the territory that it is a analogy to, it's analogous to. And that's analogous to the act of identifying with a character in a novel and going moving through a narrative. When you follow a little blue dot on a phone, a GPS system gives you absolute location and no orientation at all. So the, the two are exactly the same. What I was saying before about the way you increase your word power in a text by not looking things up yeah. is also analogous to how you increase your knowledge of the environment by not knowing your location. But in fact, having to build an awareness of location by actively orienting yourself. You know, you, nowadays, you round the entrance of any major public transport hub, people just wandering around like a lost sheep looking at their screens. Instead of actually looking at the physical world around them that would give them the information that was necessary. And dare I say it, even asking somebody for some time. Ha <laughs> <laughs> God forbid. And yeah. then you would, of course, start getting some proper local savoir faire because you'd say do you know where Nadal's chip shop is and they'd say actually it's not the best chip shop in Berwick you know they are there's still you know what I mean yeah 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 does, does that extend then Will in, into um the process of of creation as well of writing yeah? and and the way in which technology can 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 intervene with that uh, perhaps unhelpfully as well which maybe leads us neatly onto your your, your use of typewriters and uh, and that and that as a kind of vehicle for the creative process. Well, um, I, I I couldn't believe how people writers went belly up to the new technologies. I mean, I absolutely you know I'm, I've been a working journalist you know most of my well since my late twenties. So you know I began in a in a in a journalistic technology where you sometimes physically took your copy round not just to the newspaper office, but you might even end up taking your galleys from yes. the typesetter because it was a separate process to put it into the form in which printing plate would be made from. Then, you know, so in fact, I ran a small publishing business in, in the 1980s that introduced what was then called desktop publishing, where you compose yeah. a page on a computer terminal and then essentially you print your film that then gets put on the press from the computer. So I know a lot about that shit. I was always interested in print technology. I, you know, back in the day, you would mark your own copy sometimes. You'd say this is, you know, yeah, this is across 70 M's justified, nine on 11 point leading. Don't kern this. Kerning is when you actually move the characters. In the yeah. yeah mark it up with a typographic pencil because you, you and and 
as I say, I was astonished at people, you know, back to McLuhan. McLuhan says artists are experts in sense perception. How the senses are affected, particularly by technologies. You know, back to the point about the way that the technology of the train have affected the way people view yeah. landscape. As soon as you know, I didn't have a problem writing on a on one of our Alan Sugar's old Amstrad PCW nine five one twos without an internet connection. It was like a glorified typewriter, and the yeah. proto stage of that was electric typewriters that had little screens on them that you got yeah. in. Yes, in the eighties. Yeah, the IBM golf ball had them, and you could sort of type a hundred words, and then it go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, it's all contained. It's not really much of an advance on a manual. And the manual typewriter isn't much of an advance, really, on writing by hand. It's just about clarity. You yeah, still yeah. have to arrange your thoughts, or you're not going to be able to put them down. There's no cut and paste. You can't yeah. cut and paste. Cut and paste was fine, but that didn't distract. It was when you had cut and paste from the internet, when, and, not, and of images as well. Because the big, the big thing is that writing is about thinking in words. It's not about thinking in images. You can bring images in and then describe them but they kind of need to be images that you've thought about mm. so the real problem comes when you have a lot of images on the web and you're working on the same machine so you're typing along and you say she drove there's two phenomena first you say she drove she wore a purple dress and and then you think oh no it wasn't it wasn't purple it, that's banal i've used purple before and you correct it to red then you think no she's not the sort of woman who'd wear a red dress that's not her she wore a pattern dress and, You've changed it five or six times on the screen, okay? Why don't you just sit there and decide what kind of dress the woman's wearing? Yeah. So you're not actually thinking in your head anymore. You're thinking on the screen. So that's the problem. Your thinking's gone onto the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That introduces another problem when we, we get to editing, which is people rewrite on screen the whole time, which is like painting on water. They can't find their way because there's no physical analog to the text. It only exists in a virtual form, which is yeah. not too permeable to them and then the other problem is this kind of literalism factor she she wore a, a purple dress and she drove a morris traveler oh i remember what those things are like those little kind of half timbered cars that kind of district nurses drive in kind of heritage itv dramas i yeah. I, I know what they look like or oh, do i remember what they look like i better have a look on the web and see what a morris traveler looks like yeah, yeah, yeah. then you're not thinking in words you're describing a picture of a morris traveler that you've looked at on the internet you're as removed from your sensual engagement in the world as an artist as you could possibly be. Now, I don't know what the impact of all of this is on contemporary fiction, because I don't read a lot of contemporary fiction, in fact, hardly any at all. But what I do know is that nobody else is reading it much either, except for one or two big books. And there's no huge literary culture subsisting at the moment. It's, it's a shadow play. It's a kind of Potemkin village you know, where people are led out into it and say, look, at my marvellous literary culture and a lot of kind of middle-class bien pensant people go, oh, yes, isn't it nice? And then and the reality is kids don't read books much. You know, I've been trying to mentor a young woman just to, to take uh, Oxbridge exams and, and she managed four books over the summer. Four books? Mm. She, she'd get to Oxford to read literature, your reading list for a week is like 20. For a yeah. week? Yeah, yeah. It's that paradox again, I guess, isn't it? In that the that technology that we, you know, the dream was it would free and enable and and advance, but actually, I guess the 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 intimacy and the inbuilt limitations of that primitive is not the word, but of that contained device, the typewriter, um, requires. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's just for the form. The form subsists of the novel i think does subsist within the whole technology of it we, we get the novel because we get the rotary press as against the hand press i mean yeah. the last hit poem in english literary culture is byron's child harold what it's a hit you know it's some sells thousands of copies people are going oh it's a poem so there is, why? Well, it's because you don't have automated presses. You just can't print big folios easily. So the novel owes its real inception in the 19th century to the technology of being able to make them in that quantity, just like newspapers. Uh, so, you know, once the sort of culture, the, 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 the technology that it subsists in is superseded, is there really, a, I, I think, as I say, I, think, I don't think it's ever going to die as a form. It's too great a form. 
but it's yeah. just not gonna be what it was. I mean, when when was the last time a a, a serious book was a watercolor mo cooler moment in this culture? And the answer is the only books that have really managed it are, you know, the satanic verses of this world. They're books that that, are, that aren't really, it's not really about the book itself. It's about a political thing that falls outside of it. It's fascinating. Well, um, I'm, I'm keen, we're, we're, we're running on for time here. So we've got some um, questions people have been um, putting forward. Perhaps if we can move on to that and, and um, there's some interesting stuff in there. Um, uh, the first question was I'm asking about um, the rise of audiobooks, and I'll put it as it was put to, to me. This comes from Diana. It said, um, "Is my addiction to Audible causing even more rapid brain deterioration uh, than might have occurred in any case?" Um, you're not great. I mean, you can't retain as much. I mean, that's what seems to be. You know, there's one of the essays in the book, The Printed Word in Peril, that where I did look at quite a lot of the research. I think it's compromised, but I think on uh, Audible versus reading, you, you don't retain as much. And it's for obvious reasons. You're just not, you're not doing the hard yards to put it into your brain, because when you read a sentence, you have to, you think of the... <laughs> You think of the you're essentially playing through your own capacity to understand universal grammar. You're exercising that muscle in a very particular way, yeah. uh, and and you don't you just don't retain as much. But but I mean, listen, I've done quite a lot of my own books. I've read my own books for talking books, all available at handsome you know nine ninety nine price points. You never think it's ten quid, uh, and I don't. But I have to say, I don't listen to them myself. No, I don't. I find I'm, I, I just find that the, the reader's voice is completely, unless it is the author and they happen to be good at doing it themselves. I do think that the reader tends to to overall the text to some extent. You know, but I but I don't like the theatre much. I you know I look at a lot of people on stage and I think you know you're not Troilus and Cresta. You're two nice young middle class people from North London. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thanks, Will. Um, another question, and, and I should say as well, you know, do do feel free to to pop some more questions through to Peter, and he will pass them on to me. Uh, this is quite an interesting one. Is is there still a place in modern society for um, communal reading aloud? Um, it's still a part of younger development, but it fades into non-existence as we age. Is it, it, you know, is that is that something that we would? Would be yeah, I mean, well, paradox, of course, we get back there. I mean, my the students are now often so illiterate that you have to read out passages in order to discuss them in class. Because yes. they you're only wincing and you can't say anything because you're at your school and you, you may have some of your students actually watching this. But it's what I've noticed as a teacher, is of course they've done they haven't done the reading, the lessons are bust. So you stand up there and read it. So Listen to older people out there. We've already, yeah, yeah, already at university level. I will, I already found, effectively find myself having to instruct from the text in a live exegesis. What does yeah. exegesis mean? Explaining what the text means. Yes. So that's what right. happening. I mean, I think, you know, collective reading for pleasure, excellent idea. I mean, whoever proposed that, you're absolutely right. And, and again, it's the loss. And I don't get me wrong, I'm a solitary and quite asocial. So it's not like I would have loved the great age of collectivism, but I do see that it's past. You know, people, yeah. again, you know, in our culture at the moment, sport and some yeah. things like charity drives seems to take the place of real civic engagement, you know, where you actually do stuff together. And as I say, there have been a lot of these things where, you know, all of Berwick is going to read, you know, whatever, Joseph Andrews. You never do, you know, or nothing much comes of it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> very interesting, very interesting. Um, I'm looking to see if we have any other questions. Um, I'm interested, well, in the, um, the relationship between... Um, the 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 
the difficulties that you see with the with the experience of modernity and i know we've got no choice i mean it simply is where we are it's not you know there's no option other than that but the profound kind of challenges that that offers um alongside that um that continuation of the of the kind of modernist novels you know these 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 difficult novels that we're talking about that we think would be um would perhaps be mind expanding to read and that would help us to engage with that um, are themselves often um, part of that part of that very modernist project you know they, they, their style their form reflects the very disruption of the of, of modernity itself yeah um, it does. You know, and, they're, and they're not very readable often yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I mean the really great ones kind of are when you get up to speed I mean you know, but let's not gloss it. You know, I got I've got criticized a lot with the trilogy of novels I wrote as being kind of neo-modernist, being too fiendishly difficult. None of them is a patch just on Ulysses, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ulysses is way more difficult than anything I've ever written. And it took me as somebody who, you know, had an elite literary education. Well, I was educated in philosophy rather than literature, but I had a kind of elite, you know, literary education, reading and writing all my life. I'm sorry, I don't know why. I think other people should be a bit honest about this. It took me until my 40s to really be able to read Ulysses, to really be able to read it. Yeah, yeah. Not just sort of puzzle over it. It took me a long time and three readings. Yeah. One of them with a full set of annotations. I mean, yeah. it is a pinpoint accurate recollection of a single day. Yeah. In 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 the early 1900s in June in Dublin. When, when Joyce was writing it in first in Zurich and, and and then in Paris, well, first in Trieste, then Zurich, then Paris. You, anybody who came from Ireland, he'd sort of, they had to be brought around and obsessively grilled because we've got no internet <laughs> about, you know, is, cool. can you still get that kind of lemon soap that Bloom buys? In fact, you, not only could you still get it in the 1920s, you can still get it now. I washed my body with a cake of the lemon soap that Bloom looks forward to bathing. And, and as, uh, I won't say what else he looks forward to um, <laughs> in, in Joyce's Ulysses to celebrate this Bloom's Day. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there is... Uh, my analogy much more as, as somebody, you know, you, you said I'm a, a flaneur. I'm not really a flaneur. I mean, I'm a dériveur is what I'm interested in. And, and the dérive or, or the random progress across the city was something conceptualized by the French situationists, a kind of Mar Marxist group of school of the 1950s and 60s. who got much involved in, in the event more of 1968. And really the idea seems laughably simple. It's just wander around. People find yeah. it so hard to do. And of course, our technologies. So the wandering around would seem to me, and, and if you can do it, it's a huge, it frees you more than anything else from the time money matrix that encases mm -hmm. us. And I, and I would say it develops the kind of skills, as it were, practical orientation that are analogous to the skills you need to negotiate difficult texts as well. Yeah. The city, the contemporary city and urban environments generally are kind of difficult texts. Yeah. So we can tell from that you're um, you're not you're not um, suggesting that we get rid of all this kind of continental postmodern stuff and and use our you know new Brexit post Brexit sovereignty to take back control of Britain's um, fiction. But well, rather... by we you mean the British? Yes. Well, I don't. Even, I mean. Because, you know, people use the we word incontinently, don't they, if you'll yeah. forgive the pun. Uh, I'm not sure who they're speaking for a lot of the time. And and, and also it reflects, and I'm not criticising you, Nolan, but I am, really? a kind of lazy assertion about how much control we might possibly exercise. Do you know what I mean? I think you were being a little bit ironic. And yeah. we're ironising the idea that something... I was trying when I was trying. Yeah, you were, well, you did well. But, I mean, I, I, and I actually remember... Shortly after the Brexit, by running into a group of four guys who were down in London on the Raz from up your way from Newcastle, and and them saying to me, you know, we've taken back control. And I said, well, what what are you actually going to be doing, you four? What? How is your quotidian life going to change to increase your civic engagement? What are you precisely going to be doing 
that well because i said because i'm a brexit agnostic you, you you tell me you're taking back control show me that control being taken back i might well sign up for it see so nothing of the sort of course but, yeah. but you know but, and, and arguably and it's not to be sort of particularly hard on brexit brexiters it, it's arguably because there wasn't much control to take back yeah, yeah. that was the problem well i've got a question here that 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 uh, moves back towards our kind of European friends, which is uh, what is the continuing influence of W.G. Sobol? Do you, you obviously talk about them in the book and um, it, particularly in the um, chapter that looks at representations or the, the whole idea of writing about the Holocaust. Do, do you still see that is, there's, a, there's a legacy there? Well, I mean, interestingly, his legacy becomes more twisted, confused, and, and yet perversely relevant as, as time goes on, you know. I was slow on on this, painfully slow, and we're now in the midst of a real problem with anti-Semitism in this country. And for once, I'll say we, we yeah. have a problem with anti-Semitism. Uh, I'm I'm from Jewish. I'm of Jewish heritage. My mother was Jewish. You know, the English have always been a bit weird. If you if you tell if you tell English people you're half Jewish, they look at you side on. And, and then nod their heads because you've got a big nose, you know, because they then they've spotted you racially. There is a there is a tradition of racial anti-Semitism in this country. It's never been completely absent, uh, but it was very much on 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 the retreat. And I suppose in my lifetime, the thing that most showed it was, you know, the second Thatcher cabinet was, you know, certainly more than fifty percent Jewish. It was never commented on in the press. It was never it was never a big deal certainly would be now i have to say yeah. um you know so it, it kind of zabel's preoccupation with the holocaust is of course paradoxical because on the one hand he sees he's perhaps the german language writer non-jewish german language writer who's done most to properly situate the holocaust within european memory as an event of incalculable and unavoidable significance a kind of a, a surly gravity that nobody can escape and and that's part of it but at the same time he's probably the the, the great european writer and not just in the german language now uh but in 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 any other european language as well he's done most to situate the great holocaust of, of european jewry specifically within the context of industrialization itself and within the context of the looming environmental crisis perpetrated by technology that is engulfing us as we speak and and that side of Zabel's in interaction with the holocaust has been very unpalatable to people on the one hand people of course humanists feel that it's denigrating the impact specifically of the nazis exterminatory policy towards the jews and on the other hand, of course, it makes people very uncomfortable about the environmental crisis yeah. because they see that it is, you know, it's ecocide, you know, and, and that, that's very, very worrying. But, you know, it, it's hard to think of any other writer who, who's done quite that. Uh, so I think his enduring significance is that there's a new, very interesting volume of criticism on, on Zabel by, uh, edited by Uta Schuwer, who was one of his, his doctoral students, who tries to reposition him as a German language writer specifically. I don't think that's quite right. He's one of ours. <laughs> I'm going to use the we. He's yeah. an English writer as well. And even though he wrote it in German, I think that the texts were overwritten in English. So he's a very unusual phenomenon. He, and I think we in England love him, though, because he's our German. He's the, and he's the good one. You know, So I think there's a lot of kind of wanting him for England in that way, which, frankly... It's reasonable. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the time here. We could, we could, and I think we would both be happy to go on um, ad infinitum, but um, we've got to pull things together and uh, draw to a close. I know not least because there are other events which are coming up, which people will be wanting to attend. But thank you so much, um, Will, for joining us today. It's been... Um, well, it's been fascinating in its own right. It's also given an insight into the, the kind of, as I say, the breadth and depth of thinking and ideas and creativity that you can find within Wired. I ought to mention that it is for sale. If, if you're in Berwick for the festival at um, Greaves Booksellers, which is in the centre of town, but from any other quality bookshop 
Um, I, I, I suppose it's also available online as well. I imagine you can buy it through the through the digital um, monstrosity itself, if you so if you so wish. Um, but um, but but very, very very as you can tell, very well worth getting a copy of and um, and reading. Thank you very much for joining us as an audience member today, as this part of Bennett Literary Festival. Um, please do feel free to share the festival. Um, in your social media again i'm sorry to um get, you know connect into that uh, that that difficult um digital machine but we have no choice you know we're in it now please do feel free to share the festival um on social media um the credits will come up shortly they have some details of some of the other events that are coming up but the, the program of course is available online as well um and we also look forward, we hope to you returning and joining us again as a participant and, a, and an audience member next year. But I'll finish as we ought to really by um, by saying a really big thank you once again um, to Will Self. Thanks. No, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nolan. Thanks everybody else at the Merit Festival for making the event possible. Everybody have a good day. Bye for now. Bye bye.